Hey, good morning, everyone. Good to see you, and uh, good to be back. We've missed you, and uh, just want to take a moment here as we start again in our series of Mark, the Gospel, and uh, just have a greeting and uh, tell you how much I've missed being with you, and uh, look forward now uh, due to the coronavirus that uh, we can come together again through uh, video and uh, continue the Word of God spoken. So it's good to see everyone uh, and uh, certainly good to be here. I want to say special uh, thanks to Lisa and the staff and certainly for all the residents. Uh, I've truly missed you uh, and thankful now that we have opportunity to reconnect and uh, study God's Word. I've got a, a friend with us. Uh, I wanted him to uh, say hello to you. You haven't seen him in a while. And uh, so he's going to come forward and uh, just say uh, hello to everyone. Hello, everyone. Have a good day. Yeah, it's got Brother Leroy, and uh, he's uh, glad to be with you in spirit, and uh, certainly has missed all of you uh, after the passing of uh, Sister Cheryl, uh, but he's with me in spirit and with me here, and so we're going to begin to study in the class. Uh, going to pick up where we left off. We've been studying the Gospel of Mark, and so we're going to continue on in that studies and in that series. Uh, but this morning, I want to uh, just start out with, uh, before we invite the Lord into our service, uh, with a little prayer song, and uh, then we'll invite the Lord into our service. You probably know this one is just a short little hymn, but it, it says so much in the volumes of what we're uh, doing uh, about Jesus our Lord, and that is the title of it, so... I'll sing it, and then we'll sing it one more time together, and then we'll have prayer and invite the Lord in. Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer, how He loves me, how I love Him. He is risen. He is coming, oh come quickly, hallelujah. Now you sing with me. Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer, how he loves me, how I love him. He is risen, he is coming. Oh, come quickly, hallelujah. Let's pray. Father God, this morning, this midday morning, Lord, we invite nothing more than for you to be part of our service. And so, Lord, we invite you in. We ask that you would fill uh, us with your spirit and that you would move and direct us in our speaking, that all would be edified in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So, this morning, we're all pick up. Uh, as I said, where we left off into uh, Mark, and this morning we'll be studying once again in our continued study of Mark, the ninth chapter, and we'll be looking at uh, verses 38 through 41, and then on down through verse 50. So let me read the text, uh, and then we'll explore into it. Verse 9 
or chapter 9, verse 38 through 41 of the Gospel of Mark. In this text, Jesus, as he has been, is starting to prepare uh, his disciples for the cross or for when he will leave them. And so he's starting to talk to them in a more personal and intimate way. And so we're coming off the teaching about who uh, is the greatest among the disciples and uh, that teaching that we had uh, several weeks ago. And so now after that discussion we pick up with uh, verse 38 it says, John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to hinder him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not hinder him, for there is no one who shall perform a miracle in my name and be able soon after to speak evil of it. For he who is not against us is for us. Now, in that short, brief teaching on those who are for us, not against us, Jesus says some different things. First, he tells John, he says, don't hinder them. Allow them to speak. He wants them to know that the inclusion that he has in mind for uh, the future is much further and wider than what the disciples themselves are thinking. Remember, we're coming off the teaching that they wanted to know who would be the greatest among them in God's kingdom. They're not looking uh, inclusively to add others. They're thinking, if you will, about self and positioning themselves. And Jesus says, no, I don't want you to think that way. Do not hinder that person who is trying to perform whatever it is uh, they use the term here, a miracle. It could be uh, many different things because of him speaking in my name. And so we have different texts available to us uh, about that type of teaching. Uh, even in the Old Testament, as Moses brought the Israelites into camp and God appeared to them in the cloud, he spoke to them. And it says that Moses brought 70 uh, people uh, from the tribes, or if you will, those who are considered religious leaders, they're called elders, and he allowed his spirit into them. And they were able to do mighty, uh, miraculous things. And one of the disciples came to him, Moses that is, and he says, hey, there's some people back in camp who are trying and doing some miraculous things. Should we hinder them from doing this? And God in the cloud spoke through Moses and says, absolutely not. Allow the Spirit to work wherever it may be. And so even here we see that Jesus futuristically is talking about the Spirit of God coming on people and then being able to do things in His name. He goes on in verse 40 and it says, For who is not against us is for us. In other words, whom I fill with uh, my Spirit goes beyond you. And if they're doing things, it's because I'm allowing them to do things. And so in these uh, short three verses, he identifies a more inclusive group of people than the disciples themselves are thinking. And so then in verse 41, he begins a discourse coming off of that thinking. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of your name as followers of Christ... Truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. Now, there's things mentioned in there uh, that we want to explore, but the general text is, 
whatever this act is of kindness, uh, rather it's a super miracle, or rather it's just as he says here, a cup of water is giving to someone who is a follower of mine. It's a simple act, if you will, of kindness. He is basically saying this kindness, this act that is of me, finds favor with me. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you are followers of me, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. So we see what Jesus is saying here. This act of kindness, just a simple act, just as a cup of water being given to one of his followers, Jesus finds favor. That person, he says, will not lose his reward. This is something that we've talked about in times past. The attitude that we have when we follow Jesus. We have the attitude, and one of it is the attitude of kindness. Even to the point that we are willing to give those working for God even a simple drink of water. It could be in a monetary sense. It could be housing. It could be hospitality. It could be any host of things. But what he's talking about is the attitude that we have of God in our hearts to show, if you will, kindness or an act of kindness. This goes back and reminds me of the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are just different attitudes of Christ listed for us in the gospel, especially in the gospel of Matthew, about 10 verses of those, merciful, uh, those who are giving, loving, uh, kind, all those attitudes are God. They're found actually in Matthew 5, uh, chapter, verses 1 through 10. With that in mind, then, he says, someone who has an attitude of God, someone who is a follower of mine, I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. Well, we've talked about futuristic. What is the reward of following God? Well, the reward of following God probably first and foremost is that we are part of his fandom, family and in part of the family of the kingdom of God. By following Jesus, we become his family. We are in his kingdom. And so without going into any other great detail on that, it's much more than that, but that's basically what it is. He says someone who has the attitude of God and does acts of kindness, truly I say to you, they're not going to lose their reward. To be in heaven are part of God's family and to enter into the joy of the Master, who is God. And so heaven is a place that we desire for, we want to be, because the joys of heaven are incomparable with the joys we even know and, and see and experience today in this physical life. And so he says, one who has and follows me and does acts of kindness, that person will truly be in the family and in the kingdom of God. He uses uh, the term here in verse 42, and whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble. Now, he's changing the direction here just a little bit. We're still on the same topic of being uh, and doing acts of kindness and following God and being part of his uh, kingdom. It says, now whoever causes one of these little ones, in other words, one of these followers, as it says in verse 41, to stumble or to uh, have difficulty. 
it says it would be better for him, that person that causes someone to stumble, who is a child of mine, to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and he be cast into the sea. You see, this is a matter. Uh, first, we want to clear up uh, the little ones. That's just a terminology used to say a follower of God. It can be uh, this term more than anything associates with maturity uh, in your following. There are those who are at infancy uh, stages, others who are very mature, others who are not so mature. Here he just uses the broad term sense of anyone who follows me, a little one of mine. If we cause or should cause someone to stumble, it would be better, he says, to be thrown with a millstone around your neck into the sea. That's not a good scenario. That's not a good situation for anyone. God's followers uh, who are caused by someone else to stumble. And these stumbling blocks, it actually gives us three uh, through down through verse 50, but we're only going to concentrate on uh, this text here about the millstone hung around his neck. In general, though, a stumbling block, and that could be anything uh, that makes someone who has followed God fall from following and believing in God. Something that would cause them, uh, if you will, to lose divine grace or to be out of favor with God. To cause believers to stumble, it says, then basically is a serious, serious matter. It's a serious matter for us to cause someone to stumble. And so he says... It's so serious, you basically should have a heavy millstone thrown around your neck and thrown into the sea, causing, if you will, death. It is that serious. It's a life and death issue to cause someone to stumble. You see, for Christians, a supreme or something that is of the utmost importance is that we conduct ourselves in such a way that we cause no one else to stumble in their faith or in their belief of God or on account, if you will, of our example. It's a serious, serious matter. And so he's instructed them through these two verses how serious it is, but yet also how joyous it is, on the other sense, to be part of God's family and to take upon yourself his beatitudes or his attitudes with your fellow man. And you have acts of kindness and acts of goodness that bring you into a good relationship with God and you find favor in God's sight. In verse 43, it goes on with the severity, if you will, of the nature of someone or the attitude of someone who would put a stumbling block in front of someone else. And so he says here in verse 43, And if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell into the unquenchable fire. Now, we said this is a life and death matter. And so, in this, he is symbolizing to us through this language how things are very serious in those who cause others to stumble. Those who cause others to fall out of favor with God. It's so serious. He says, if you're doing something, here he uses the word, uh, your hands, uh, stealing, just for instance. And you show and you cultivate an attitude of that, and then you try and pass it on to somebody else. You're a cohort who is encouraging someone to steal. 
He said, well, you need to just cut your hand off. You need to get rid of that. You need to be able, uh, it would be better for you to cut off your hand and to quit that and quit imposing that uh, attitude on someone else than having both hands and going into hell because that stealing and that koshering that you're doing to cause someone else to follow in your footsteps is against the will of God. And he said it's very, very serious. It is almost like an act of radical uh, surgery, if you will, spiritual surgery. Often sin, often stumbling blocks can be conquered only by radical spiritual surgery like he's using here, the terminology, cut your hand off. You have to go in, you have to get rid of that. In a literal sense, not so sure, but what he's saying is it would be better for you to cut that out, get rid of that, that stealing. It's almost like radical surgery. Liken it to cutting as we would understand a growth, something uh, cancerous. We go in, the doctors cut it out of us. It's, a, it's surgery. It's in a physical way, but here he's talking about in a spiritual way. Cleaning, if you will, yourself up. Getting rid of that attitude. Get rid of that which is not in favor with God. Get rid of, get rid of it. Identify the cause of what's keeping and putting stumbling blocks from you into others' way and in harm's way to others. Serious, serious matter. It's a matter of heaven and hell. That's what he's saying there in verse 44. When their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, it's talking about someone who has not found favor with God. And it leads them if you will, away from God and to the point that their judgment in a serious matter, this stealing that we're talking about, would lead them away from God into what we understand to be hell, not heaven. And so it's, it's a serious matter. And he's wanting them and taking them, if you will, beyond their thinking of what kindness is and who should have the abilities with the empowerment of God through the Holy Spirit to be able to be those who are full of the attitude of God. If we lose sight of that and we lose sight of our relationship with God and cause someone to stumble, it's a serious matter. First, we have to take care of ourselves. I've told you uh, over the last year or so that even where you're at, you're in a, a home, you're of age, you're elderly, you don't have the ability as much now as you used to be to be uh, in, uh, active and out socially, but yet you are within a social environment. And I've told you and asked you, said, hey, just be kind to each other. Just have kind words to say to each other. Build each other up. When someone is not having a good day, be their friend. And so this too is the same message. It doesn't matter the circumstance, where you're at, what your age is. If you're a child of God, a little one of God, you should have the attitude of God and the beatitudes of God and lift other people up and in doing so, lifting yourself up and finding favor with God. When we do that, there is no uh, fear of condemnation about being, in an eternal sense, separated from God. Not in heaven with God, but in the unquenchable fire of hell. As the terminology in verse 44 says. And so 
these issues as we see recorded for us and it's all in red it's Jesus' own words is for us to take on the attitude of God he goes on then as in all things he always tells us and gives us an antidote to any lesson that we have studied Jesus always gives us an antidote the cure if you will or the blessings if you will and here he says in verse 49 for everyone will be salted with fire in verse 50 it says salt is good but if that salt becomes unsalty with what will you make it salty again have salt in yourself and be at peace with one another this is some terminology again but it's uh, applicable if you will to their day and time but yet in our day and time also he uses these analogies as if you will salt and fire we've kind of already been introduced to uh, the unquenchable fire that describes what hell is like it's a total separation from God and, and it's, it's about fire and burning but never being put out and now he uses and puts a, the, uh, another analogy with it he talks about salt the antidote salt in the Old Testament and in ancient times symbolized purity it also symbolized, or symbolized wisdom you've heard the old saying uh, he's a salty dog. That's usually a com uh, complimentary phrase, meaning he's, he's wise. He's been around. He understands pretty good. But it also means salt purifies, prepares uh, different food substances for us. And in ancient times, that's what they used it for. And they would understand this concept of salt. It's talking about purifying, the purifying agents, if you will, of salt through refining. The salt refines the meat. The salt purifies the meat. The salt preserves the meat. And it is prepared and prepares of God the meat. And so we understand this antidote about salt and fire refining, coming together and purifying and refining and preserving and preparing, if you will, us, those who are salted for God. Now, with that said, we're preparing for what? We're preparing for eternal life in God. Now again, we go back to the first of our study. What is and what are we preparing for by following God? And he says to be part of my family and to be part of the kingdom of God, not only now physically, but also in eternity. All right, as we continue on, we conclude that salt is good. It's of God. It's throughout scripture listed for us as a good thing so having salt is even mentioned for us throughout the gospels of the apostles being salt and light of the world and so in the inclusion that we're talking about of the grace of God uh, being given to more than just the apostles then we can conclude that we are salt and light of the world as we teach and go about our business here uh, for the things of God. And so, salt is good. Now, he goes on to say, if it becomes unsalty, with what will we make it salty again? And uh, the terminology there is saying, just what we've said, if someone causes someone to stumble, uh, 
well, we're not salty anymore. We're really, we're not finding favor with God because of whatever actions we're in. We talked about uh, stealing uh, and cutting off our hands to get rid of that and get back uh, to the things of God and how we can find favor with God. And so he, he just says salt is good. But if it becomes salty, well, what will you make it salty again? Well, I think we all can understand if salt is good, then we need to get salty again. And in other words, we need to get God in our lives again. Uh, cut this, uh, whatever it is, this uh, notion that we can do things against God's will and it's okay. Well, it's, it's not okay. We have to get rid of that. We have to pick up the attitudes of God and make our lives salty again. And so he says with that thought, have salt in yourself and be at peace with one another. So he says, hey, get salty again. Make sure that you get salty again. Here, the last phrase and be at peace with one another. And so it goes back to the teachings. If we're in tune with God, we find this peace uh, that we can have and obtain uh, in all matters, in all situations, just by our relationship with God. You know, it's such a good thing to be salty, uh, to be able to understand that with being uh, in tune with God, we have peace. And it goes beyond that. He says, be at peace with one another. And so it's, it's a peace and it is listed for us throughout many scriptures uh, that this peace uh, covers so much it's almost inexpressible to explain uh, what this peace is. But that's how you find it. You get salty. You get right with God. You get, uh, if you will, into God and be part of his family. Uh, and so, as always, he gives us the antidote uh, to what the problem is. And the problem is we've got to get right with God. We've got to keep our attitude uh, in favor with the attitude of God. And to carry out and not cause stumbling blocks uh, for anyone else and including ourselves. We're prone to uh, causing our own stumbles. And our own falling away from God. And God says, no, get salty again. And uh, be part of God's family. And so today as we close, uh, as always, we want to look at uh, and ask Roy. I hope, I hope Roy's there so we can sing our closing song and then have prayer on behalf of the home and certainly for each of you. Uh, so Roy, get your... Get yourself ready, and we'll do our closing song here. Uh, God is so good. God is so good. He's so good. He's so good. He's so good to me. I love him so. I love him so, I love him so, he's so good to me. I'll do his will, I'll do his will, I'll do his will, he's so Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this uh, time we've spent together in your word. I ask, Lord, that you would bless uh, this home and certainly all the staff and for their love and care for the residents. Ask your blessings upon the residents likewise, Lord. Uh, may they have a good day. 
Uh, we've had a good day in studying your word. Now, Lord, that they're about to uh, have lunch, that you bless that food to the nourishment of their bodies. And as always, Lord, we thank you for opportunities to serve. May they serve each other and always has a good word to say and a gladness in their hearts. So we thank you and we praise you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Look forward to seeing you next week. God bless each one of you.